Okay, it's the final Lakers mixtape on The Last Dance Doc with uh, Dino and Joel and Charlie here. Um, you can find this on Beat Junkie Radio on Dash Radio dot com forward slash beat junkie radio the on demand is on plug one two and lakers nation philippines on facebook so let's hop right into it guys reactions to episode nine and ten if not uh overall reactions to the doc Mm -hmm. all right well nine and ten uh, i thought they were both good episodes um nine i i like the behind the scenes um during the playoffs of that that uh, Pacers series, and then uh, episode ten, I I liked how they closed it out. Yeah, the pacing was great, man. For episodes yeah. nine and ten, Joel, you were gonna mm-hmm. say something? Yeah, seven and eight were still my favorite. Nine and ten were uh, a cherry on top, though. I would say. Um, I mean, but seven and eight still take the cake for me. Bro, I'm going to have to ask you, what was on 7 and 8 again? I don't even remember. <laughs> 7 and 8 was the whole Space Jam uh, ah. thing. Yeah, that those episodes. I mean, those mm-hmm. mainly because they brought up memories for me. So, um, and, and just really just imagining that pickup game is, is still blows my mind. Yeah, the difficult part of watching this live versus on demand is I'm taking notes while I'm watching, and then these commercial breaks are not long at all, you know? (laughs) So I'm looking at Twitter reactions, I'm looking at Facebook reactions, which I think is wrong, but I'm starting to see a lot of converts and a lot of people that are acknowledging it. But as far as for episode 9 and 10, I love the pacing. It was just amazing Mm -hmm. as far as for like, okay, the metabolism is up, um... There's no more hip hop. This is orchestral music, suspense based music, and it's about mm-hmm. like almost a, a themic, heroic, uh, to the rescue type feel to to the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. So it's changed. And as far as yeah. for episode ten, it was very like oh, floating on air, you're in heaven, and it's very like closure to what was happening, you know, and. I think it, it, it's an awesome doc. I don't know what to compare it to because I don't want to compare it to anything yet, but I really enjoyed the 10 part series. I don't know if I could watch episode 11 or 12 guys, <laughs> or if it was a 15 part oh, episode, I'd be like uh, exhausted. Yeah. And do we really want to see a documentary on the Washington wizards, Jordan? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That yeah, was, nine and ten really, really had that, you know, cowboy walking into, walking off into the sunset feel. That was that's what was great about him to me. You think you would have been able to watch like a few more episodes, Deans, on on this doc? No, I think I think the way they ended, it was uh, good to go. You know, especially like what Joe said about like the cowboy walking off and how you know how they how Phil they ended it with like Phil with them burning up the letters. In the locker room with the lights out, I was like, you know, couldn't get any better than that. It was dope. Yeah, so, you know, Joel posted on our text thread, and he brought up a theory. Let me go ahead and pull it up right now. So let me go ahead and read that. Um, Joel was asking... No, let me go to the Skip Bayless portion part first. Joel texted me and Dino and said, by the way, Skip Bayless, I call him Skip Baseless, haha, thinks Phil Jackson already had a handshake deal with the Lakers during 1998 season. Thoughts? And the other thing that uh, Joel asked was, what if it was right after Krause told him he's not coming back, even if he goes 82-0? What if he was plugging Genie already? Meaning, you're talking about boning and giving him the triangle fucking pee pee into into the vagine, right? So, Joel, since you asked that first, I'll, I'll let you get the reins first. What were your thoughts about your question? Okay, well, um, 
even even if it is skip baseless um <laughs> uh, i tend to honestly i i feel like phil is a very calculated guy and he might have had all you might have already had plans you know the the whole genie thing was a joke obviously but i really think that you know, when you tell a guy who's as smart as Phil Jackson that, you know, you're done, you're going to already prepare for what's to come, even though it might not happen. So I have this weird feeling, you know, that he really did have something going on with the Lakers already. He really did. So, and he, because he saw a potential in that Lakers team, or, you know, maybe he just had, you know, maybe it was simple as, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could imagine Mitch Kupchak doing this, but you know, I, it might have been Jerry Buss giving me a call saying, "Hey, you know, um, I don't know what's going to happen with all that drama you guys had before this year. What do you think about the Lakers next year?" Mm-hmm. So. Do you know your thoughts? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I would have put it past them. I mean, I'm sure, like, if he wasn't talking to them already. Um, I think he was, you know, it was probably in his head, you know, he was probably thinking about it if he wasn't talking to anybody. But at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if the Lakers were already, it's a business. So, and I'm sure they, they put out some feelers to see how he was feeling about it. Yeah. And so Dino, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read the screenshots that that you sent. So, Mm -hmm. uh, Dino sent the first screenshot in, in quotes to Phil Jackson. I see that as a challenge, but the challenge would be have to have him submit to the triangle offense. This is Phil Jackson talking about Shaquille O'Neal, and I believe in its principles. It's nothing more than overloading one side of the floor. It's a center in offense. And here with the Bulls, we never really had that center. It's amazing. Who's the perfect center for the triangle? Shaq. And then exclamation point, Shaq. Throw the ball into this guy. What's the defense going to do? Dino, do you recall roughly when, like year-wise, when that quote came about? Yeah, this was um, during that last season, the last dance season. So what happened during that season was um, ESPN got at Phil and then asked him to pretty much keep a diary throughout the season. And so in that diary, these are some of the excerpts that you're, you're reading right now. Okay, so the second screenshot that Dino sent, but then if someone like the Lakers comes after me and wants me to coach a team that's ready to pursue a championship, what can I do? I have to admit, I watched a little of the Lakers on TV last night. Okay, so that's in compliment to both Joel's um, opinion that he just said on behind the mic, and I I assume, Dino, you were sending these screenshots because you agree with Joel. Right. Okay. So let me add more context. They lost at home to Phoenix. I watched Shaq and he got taken out of the game for committing his fourth foul, a brutish kind of foul. He was angry. He comes off the bench and he's arguing with Dell Harris, the coach. Dell is saying, you can't do that. And Shaq is saying, what the fuck do you mean? I can't. The fucking ref didn't call a foul at the other end. Harris says, doesn't matter. Shaq can't get it through his head. It didn't frighten me, but it was a warning signal. Is this kid smart enough yet to know what he can and can't do to become? And it's it's blocked at that point as far as for um, to become a winner. To become a winner. Okay. Yeah. So my theory is leaning towards. Uh, I I I said something. Let me read what I said. I said correlation does not lead to causality, mm-hmm. but who knows. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's correlated? What I what I mean by that, listening audience, is the correlation here is he's commenting about Shaq, and I want I want you who's listening to be a sophisticated listener because when you digest information, it's so rapid in this uh, social media world where contextual timeline is key for someone like me who's forty four in an analog world, raised in an analog world. You have to factor, how was that brought up? Meaning, did someone pull it out? Now, like what Dino said, yes, because it's a point to where, you know, it's kind of like the uh, basketball virtue signaling. You know, this is Phil Jackson's way 
of going, you know what, you short fat fuck? You're saying even if we do 82 and 0 and you're not going to fucking sign me, which is the balls of you to say, and I brought you fucking five rings, fuck you. That's me prepping up the soup and salad. And what I mean by correlation does not need to causality is you have to look at an article and ingest and digest the information because what happened, Phil needed time off. He, at the end of uh, episode 10, and what he actually did was he took a year off. That's what I meant in context to correlation does not need to causality because there is correlation because he put out that that uh, quote, but who asked it? Was it just a self-indulgent, hey, let me just say this and no one asked it? So with this, with Dino um, showing the quote and then Joel actually spitting out the fact that, you know, hey, uh, this is an ideation of Phil Jackson. Then of course, then of course. So I just wanted people to learn how to listen, learn how to read because there are specifics. So with my answer, now that Dino showed that screenshot and after talking live in this moment, even though it's live to tape, live in this moment, there had to be. And guess who sent the the, the bat signal out first? PJ did. <laughs> PJ had to send out the bat signal. But what stipulates the in-between to that is probably Phil Jackson said, you know what? I really need a break. So I can't say yes for a year. What well, what do you guys think about my theory? Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. He did need a break. I mean, just what they went through uh those past couple of years, it, it was mentally, physically draining for everyone on that squad, you know? And I'm not surprised that he would need some time off. <laughs> well, that that was a strike here, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm-hmm. Um, th- do you think that that had anything to do with his decision just to not coach? Uh, what what do you, what do you mean by that? Sorry, Joel. There, there. Remember, um, they were going into a, a lockout, right? So, um, and it was going into that shortened season. So, of course, the the um, the timeline for the off season was a lot longer. You know, I'm I'm wondering if that. You know, I mean, if that kind of weighed into his decision, if he uh, if he kind of got comfortable just being off for a little bit. So basically, if the season started again on time, would he have maybe gone to another team right away? Um, well, history and pattern tells me PJ likes to take a year or two off. That's true. You know, that that's what history tells me. And yeah. I think the point of exhaustion of him being an assistant coach since, what, 88? 87 Mm -hmm. he was nonstop. so keep in mind that's a solid 10 years and his pattern with the lakers albeit um fired the first time uh after Mm -hmm. the pistons uh beating the shit out of the lakers Mm -hmm. when his last season with kobe in 2011 when they get swap when they got swept by dallas he didn't Mm -hmm. even want to coach that season so he just did that as a favor. And, you know, history as a teacher, I, I think he really needed time off. So that, 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 that's my opinion. And then uh, Joel also brought up behind the scenes. Um, well, I think me and Joel were exchanging at that point. Do, do the Bulls win number seven? So I'll let you guys start off. Uh, before I answer, but do the Bulls win number seven after not not before episode nine and ten, after taking in every factual or <laughs> PR or commercial type um, viewing from episode nine and ten? Do you think the Bulls win number seven? Mm. Yeah. Um. Well, I don't, I think. Honestly, I think Asia is catching up to them. I don't, you know, they probably would have gotten close, but I don't think they would have pulled it off. I think everyone was starting to break down. You would have seen another 
a year older Rodman, a year older Pippen, a year older Jordan. I mean, we we saw in that last series, Pippen was hurt. So I don't know if they would have, you know, I don't know if they would have came back full strength for that seventh. I, I think I'm going to stick with my answer from the last one. Um, yeah, but a lot of things would have had to happen. All the same things that happened um, the off season before, plus getting Pippen his money would have had to happen. And I really do think that the longer off season would have helped them out a lot. So I think they would have not have been as dominant, but they I, I didn't see anybody beating them if they were well rested. But those are two, I mean, those are a couple of huge ifs. I mean, but it feels like it's one of those championships that where everything had to fall in place for them to win. And, um, but I think it was definitely possible. Um, would it have been a definite championship? No. I, do I think they would have, they might have won it? Probably. Okay, from what I said last time, if I recall correctly, and correct me, guys, if, if I don't remember much anymore. Um, Mine was all contingent if uh, everyone is willing to pay, and especially Pippen. That's what I said. But after watching episode 10, I don't think they win. Rodman uh, physically was already breaking down. I mean, there was that point where he just, oh, fuck it. I'm going to do a wrestling show, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to call you guys. You know? And, and uh, honestly, I, I think... Pippin was at the pinnacle of like, you know what, man? I'm 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 causal to six rings and Dunzo. You guys already disrespected PJ, and even if PJ decided to come back, even if Scotty for some reason decided to go, you know what? I'll take whatever the Bulls was willing to pay, and the Bulls were willing to pay him something decent. But uh, honestly, I, I, it really looked like uh, even Rodman was already getting to a point of like he's he's exhausted, he's he's done, you know. And and for me, I think it's easier in hindsight to look. Well, they had a lot of rest, which was my fault for saying that, Joel, last time. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's it's hard to determine hindsight in real time. That's why it's yeah. real time. Yeah. But yeah, I and mean, that's I mean, that's that's three different perspectives. Go ahead. Yeah, you bring up Rodman. I mean, let, we could talk about Rodman because every time we think he would be, you know, a piece of crap, this guy. I don't know. I guess that's that's just how he's wired. He comes back and he just tells everybody, "Look, I'm playing basketball." Right? Think, think about this. In 48 hours, Rodman, you know, he ditched practice to no consequence. Fought, D, fought Diamond Dallas Page on Nitro, made the game clinching free throws in the finals game, then went home with Carmen Electra. Who had a better 48 hours than Dennis Rodman, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that guy yeah. is wired different. You know, we, we, we look at him and, you know, I mean, I, I, I remember I kept doubting Rodman. I kept doubting Rodman. But man, next thing you know, the guy pulls down 12 rebounds, 15 rebounds, and does his job. Yeah. Rodman is like the fucking ultimate ringer. I saw that on Twitter today. Someone took that out. Like, he's the ultimate ringer. You hear all this shit that he does, and it's like, oh, he's not coming out to play. Comes out in the game and just balls out. Mm-hmm. You know what he means? It's just nuts how he does that. And, and then, with, with, you know, and, and then I'll, I'll bring up the back thing again. You know, I'm not sure if this will happen because he didn't do too well in Houston. But, I mean, if, if, he had, if Pippen had a longer offseason and, and more stability in the offseason, as to knowing who he's going to play for. I mean, you never know. His back might have been okay, you know, especially if Jordan was the one who said, you know, Pip, let's run this back. And the only way Jordan was going to come back is if Bill Jackson came back. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, um, I think they would have won, but it would have taken a lot, and they probably would have had to gotten lucky lucky at that point to win. But at the same time, you know, they're, they're, you know, they, they, they have a tendency to make their own luck. You know, they, they've shown that. So. I'm, I'm looking at the Bulls roster. Let's say Rodman's in it, but everyone else, Mario Bennett, Mark Bryant, 
Andrew Lang, Dickie Simpkins. Who the fuck is going to do anything aside from Rodman? So, Tony. yeah, Tony was still there, but yeah. the the exhaustion, uh, it's just, it just, for me, it just wasn't there, but fair enough. That's, that's what you yeah. guys think. And that's what you think, you know, I mean, I, I just, yeah, it had to be so perfect, but in Joel's description, there was a hindsight script that could have been perfect. But for me mm-hmm. and, and Dino, I guess for the listeners, there's the Dino Charles side and there's the um, Joel side. And, and one thing too, after watching episode, episode 10, you know, if, if you are not only a Bulls fan, if you're from Chicago and you're a Bulls fan, you watch episode 10, how do you feel about Jerry Krause? You know, I mean, this is really the difference between someone like Jerry Buss and the two Jerry's from Chicago. Because with Jerry Buss... It is, you know, a major market, but Chicago, you know, with Jordan, it became a major market. And he, with Jerry Buss, it's like, dude, spending is not an issue. And, and and honestly, if I was Jerry Reinsdorf, I would like, because he said it in episode 10, you know, their market value was low. I would have said, fuck it. One more year. How do you guys react to that if you're a Chicago Bulls <laughs> fans from Chicago? So in that regard, the way you described it, and and it's funny, I kind of wanted to bring this up some way tonight, is that, or today, I should say, is that maybe everybody's putting these this blame on, on a guy like Krauss, but I really think it's on Reinstorf. I really do. Because Reinstorf could have come in and said, you know, well, you know the whole thing with, with, uh, with Phil Jackson, who, who to me was the first domino to fall in order for everything to happen for everybody to come back. Because bottom line, Jordan said he won't play without, you know, with uh, Phil Jackson. Mm-hmm. So myself could have come in and said, look, Phil, I'll give you another $10 million this year. It's not going to count against cab. We're making a lot of money, you know, come back. Let's try to, let's try to do this again. You know, <laughs> you know, and I'm saying maybe that would have, convinced Jordan to stay. Jordan could have talked to Pippen and then, you know, the dominoes could have fallen. But it, it makes me think that, you know, when when there's so many parts, like there's a lot of parts here, like you're talking about Kraus, Reinsdorf, I mean, you know, Kraus, Reinsdorf, uh, the, the thing with Pippen, Jordan, all of these factors that contributed to the Bulls breaking apart, you have to look to the top. And the top was Reinstorf because at the, in the end, the owner is going to have the last word on anything that happens, you know, as far as how the money spent. Um, and it looks like how the money spent is a huge, was a huge thing. You know, I, I maybe just he fe- would have uh, stepped. Go ahead. Go ahead. Get finished up. Maybe he would have stepped on Krause's feet. But at that point, that team was already put together um, for that, you know, for one more year. You know, he could have gotten another GM in there and just put together a whatever team, right? I guess. And um, I think they would have had, they would have at least competed. You know, this is where I put a lot of blame on both Jerry's, but heavily on on, on uh, Kraus. Mm-hmm. For Pippen, they swap this guy named Rogers in a second rounder. <laughs> That's a GM move. Also approved by the by, by the owner, but he's a lot more quiet. And we all know mm-hmm. the verbosity behind Kraus. He's always, always giving props to the front office. And that's a big, giant, bumble move. Rodgers <laughs> in a second rounder for Pippen. And that's why I feel, not to contradict you, Joel, yeah. that's why I'm forthright with my opinion, is Rodgers in a second rounder for Pippen. Go ahead, Dino. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, I felt like, yeah, I agree with you. If somehow Reinsdorf could have, like, stopped Kraus in the beginning, he would have had, I think they would have had a chance to save that team and keep them together. But Bingo. I mean, from the, but from the get go, Kraus is like, no, this is the last, you know, this is, this is, this is it. It's over. And then 
Reinsdorf comes in at the end when all is done, everything's done already. He's like, then he goes out and talks to Phil like, hey, do you want to come back? It's too late for that. You let that shit brew. Mm -hmm. Yep. One thing I observed, though, towards the end, and I know any listener will know I'm a Jordanite. I'm a Jordan Magic Bird guy. The one thing I, 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 I saw where I cry foul on Jordan is when he said that they would have signed. I, I just think that there's no way they would have signed because of the animosity, the exhaustion, and and just like the, the appearance uh, that 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 was already cooked. The ruminating, uh, pre-cooking to the anger was there. Mm-hmm. Did you guys think Jordan mm-hmm. would have really signed? Um, no, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, I mean, the way they felt, they already, you know, they already, I, they already checked out. I don't think he would have he signed. I think he's just saying that just to say that. Yeah. And, well, maybe maybe if Kraus was gone. He might have considered it. Nice but, one. You know, honestly, mm-hmm. I really, yeah, you know, maybe Jordan was tired at that point. And, you know, like I said, there's a long off season again. So, but if Cross was gone and there was another GM in there, they would have had a slightly better chance of saving the whole team. Yeah. Because that would, that would have proven, I mean, that would have shown that Ryan, Ryan Stark was committed to the team and, you know, not his, not his ego or Jerry Cross's ego. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and the one thing um, that would frustrate me if I was a Bulls fan is when you look how determined Jordan was in in the end of episode ten, where it's like, dude, I, I still, I still think we had it. I still would have willed our way, but there's no way that would have led into anything. <sighs> To the pro Lakers side, you know, I was, I was thinking about that. They win in 99 and let's say PJ takes another break. I don't think we, we get to sign PJ. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Unless he is a plugging genie already. <laughs> right. Some, some long distance boning, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know what kind of fuck we have too about for the Ted was um, after all this you know, talking about Jerry Krause, and then what kind of got me was what Pippen said about Krause, too. Because then at the very end, he was sort of like, no, he was, you know, he he wasn't really talking shit about Krause out there. He was giving him more props than anything. Kind of kind of messed me up a little bit with that, just because of how they built up Krause throughout this whole documentary. And at the very end, Pippen pretty much says, no, he was cool. Yeah, um... It, it was shocking because I, I felt like Pippen was the most confusing to observe <laughs> out, yeah. out of this whole doc, <laughs> wouldn't you guys say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But but I will say I don't I don't remember if, it was, if it's episode nine or ten, but that was a redemption episode for Pippen, dude. Wow. All the stupid bullshit he went through, but for them to reshow Pippen, it's funny because you watch it in a camera wide where it's the whole half court. Mm-hmm. If you guys were watching that game live or post live, you know Pippen had a bad back. But when you see yep. it, when you see it like at, at a TV cowboy shot where at least it's from the waist up, it, it's so mm-hmm. much more intense what he was going through with his back problems. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what stuck out to me, too. I was like, man, he was really going through some shit that game. He was really hurt. You know, and I was like, yeah, much props to him. He, he fucking, he, he beasted it through. It, it really reminded me of what Larry Bird was going through with his back for a long time as well. Um, mm-hmm. He had a bad back, and, like, he would just tough it out, and it was pretty amazing what he did. And it was it was pretty crazy. Same thing with, I mean... Just to watch Pippen, basically, you know, you know, you have that hurt back run where your feet are touching the ground at the same time. That's what he was doing mm-hmm. the whole time, like gingerly yeah. running, and he was still being effective. Dude, in the in the very beginning of that episode, it was in the first quarter. Scottie Pippen gent, gently 
throws a two-handed dunk and he lands on the floor and then you see him fucking scrunch his face and i was just and like holy f- exactly yeah. so i i thought jordan and the the production team and editing room really gave pippen a good look dude it's like okay mm-hmm. we know you're fickle you know you're a bitch as far as for like your contract <laughs> you know what i mean but but Beta as, bitch. but, but <laughs> yeah. All right, but but as far as for what he did in in that huddle, when he was like telling Jordan, "Dude, I'm willing to set the screen and take a charge," and he was in and out of the court, "I'm willing to take a charge," and this fool had a bad back, absolutely redemptive for Scottie Pippen, and it, it's kind of mm-hmm. like his his uh, flu game or pizza game. You know what I mean? Yes. Pizza game. <laughs> That too, man. <laughs> what, what, did you guys know about the pizza um, I, I, incident? I always thought no. it was a, a, a flu. I thought it was yeah, flu I as well. Was, yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, I thought he had the flu. I did not know about that. Yeah, it, yeah, it was just crazy that whole story. Because I don't like. I want to fully believe it, but at the same time, there's like. There's some things that are kind of sketchy to me. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Like the whole part about, you know, the five guys bringing the pizza to Jordan. Right? And they're leaving stuff out because Jordan's security team was tight. They were locked, right? So nothing could get through. How do you let five 20 year olds come at 2 o'clock in the morning to come and deliver your pizza? Like that doesn't fit right with me. And, and the other thing that doesn't sit right with me is like, you're suspicious of dudes bringing up the pizza. And this pizza has how many pieces? You're eating the whole thing by yourself. I mean, you're not having one somebody else kind of just test out the waters with one of these. Maybe it's a piece. Yeah, uh, I mean, that <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I can knock out a whole pizza to myself even at 44 yeah. years old. <laughs> but but you're right. <laughs> but you're right <laughs> in regards to uh, not having someone try it. And, yeah. and and honestly, that's that's another thing. Um, I will, for all I care, dude. He, may, maybe this guy had fucking gonorrhea because he banged the bitch and his dick was hurting at that game <laughs> more than a fucking <laughs> flu game. You know what I'm saying? You know. Um, but but it's very difficult to fake what he did during that first half. I mean, you just yeah. saw him. The way his head was yeah. sweating. But I, I don't know mm-hmm. if it was it was partially just fucking diarrhea and a small mm-hmm. fever. But, you know, I mean, if it legitimately was food poisoning, props to him. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely. Like, I agree. Like, he, you know, he was sick. He was going through some shit during that game. It's just, maybe it's the way they told the story on the dock. Like, it just didn't add up, you know? There's like something missing there. They just weren't telling the whole truth. It could have been like, yeah, he, he did have the flu, and Jordan could come out. Yeah, I was I was fucking sick that game. That I'm like, okay, cool, move on. But just the way they right. told the story, it just it sounds a little sketchy. Well, we know Jordan was a drinker too. What if he took like some pain, some weird painkiller and you know had a drink? You know, we don't know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, several and drinks. Of course, you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna want to say that, right? <laughs> I mean, and then people. People are trying to compare it to that, you know, the 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 burger in Sacramento to Kobe, you know. But I mean, with Kobe, I, I tend to believe it because Kobe is by himself, anyways, and you know, it's just the burger and fries, right? It's not a whole pizza. I, <laughs> so. I I suspect Kobe was kind of trying to copy Jordan again. It's like, well, for yeah. pizza, <laughs> well, it's for pizza for him, and maybe I'll just use a burger. And that's that's the yeah. game, <laughs> you know. Is that the game where Kobe didn't shoot much at all? If not, like didn't shoot the second half. Well, I, I also believe if we, yeah, I think that was it. I think we would have been talking about it more if he actually won that game. <laughs> so, right, and they, it, they ended up losing. So, and it was non-playoff, was it, Joel? If you remember, I don't. No, it, 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 I believe it was a playoff. I believe it was game two of. Uh, it was the conference finals. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think the Lakers actually had a winning streak going into that game. And they lost a winning streak in that game because, you know, and Kobe's sitting there, oh, it's, I had the flu, you know, or I had food poisoning. 
Wait, you Man, guys I got, a lot of that. Yeah, you guys got to help me figure this out because I know there's a particular game where Kobe was getting bashed uh, by the media and the coaches had said something like, hey, don't shoot as much. If someone's open, pass it. And then it was like a pout mm-hmm. game where he pouted and just didn't shoot because that what that's what was prefaced. Before comments wise, you guys kind of make this. Let me know. I, I I definitely remember something like that, but I don't know if it's the Burger Game or not. From what you're mm. talking about, I, yeah, I don't I don't think that was a Burger Game. I think I vaguely remember what you're talking about, but I don't think that was a Burger Game. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, and and the crazy thing that they showed on the stats was. Mm. Uh, that flu game Jordan had, I think he scored like 44 points. Sure. You know, he had, uh, he, or no, in 44 minutes, he scored 38 points. You know, so I, I think there was like, a, there was like a couple of free throws where he missed and then he decided to trust the team, if I remember it correctly. So it was just one of those really dope, like, uh, trust based championship leadership games, you know, and when he trusted them, and then he just felt a little better. And then, okay, here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and um, apply this. Here's what it is now I'm gonna be Air Jordan. So, yep, that was pretty amazing. Uh, um, I mean, we, we, we see he had this, he had, like you said, he had 38 points, right? I think people forget the fact that the Bulls in total scored only 90 points. So that makes it even crazier. Than me. Almost <laughs> half. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wasn't it crazy, guys, how I forget uh, during like one of the Pacers games on episode nine, and then they were up by five and they're like, Oh, it's looking like we're going to win this. Like in today's game, a five-point lead with 30 seconds left ain't shit. Nothing. <laughs> you know? It, it, I, Nothing. I, was, I, was, I was like watching that and I go, holy fuck. Because a lot of these uh, playoff games, the Bulls barely won by four or three mm-hmm. or six, you know? Um. Do you guys feel if the Pacers won, like the same theory I had, like if Portland won against the Lakers, they may have spurned a dynasty or at least two rings if the Pacers would have won against the Bulls? No, because I think Jordan would have been on his revenge tour the next year. <laughs> oh, okay. I think they would have, he would have really pushed to come back and he would have really tried to get the team to come back. Mm-hmm. And I think he would have come back, you know, because remember Jordan, Jordan's a grudge holder. So he's not going to let somebody get the best of him. He's going to come back and he's going to be like, look, okay, you may have had your day in the sun, but I'm coming I mean, for you. I mean, yeah, he did that. He did that after losing to the magic, right? Yes. He spent that whole summer in game time. He was like, fuck that. Can't believe he beat yeah. me. And yeah. he worked on, it, you know? Yeah, because I think what that was a uh, number forty-five jersey, Jordan, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, it, it, it's interesting watching that guys like how they had the Davis brothers and Rick Smiths, and I'm like, dude, those are lane clogging motherfuckers in today's yeah. game, dude. Oh my god, dude! <laughs> Rick Smith in his prime was ridiculous. Yeah. He was, and, and Dell Davis they had them low Rick man. guys, yeah. Yeah, what they had down low is just a freaking wall. It was crazy. Not to mention that uh, Reggie Miller, I mean, he's the push-off king, you know? I mean, he's only 180 pounds, but he leans into you. He, he you know, he pushes, I mean, they, they showed it. He pushed off for Jordan. Jordan outweighs him by 30 pounds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. The best shot, though, was when the camera, I think after Reggie Miller hit that shot and they they put the camera on the bench, and everyone's celebrating the bird. You see Larry Bird's face like, don't fucking celebrate, man. It's not over yet. <laughs> you see? Because Bird's yeah. seen it. So he's like, yeah. don't, don't do that. Don't do that. 
<laughs> yeah, and I remember live in that moment, and uh, uh, Bob Costas was commenting on it, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Dude, I've been there before." But really, <laughs> with, with the documentary, the dope thing was uh, what they stipulated. Because live in that moment, I, I agreed with Bob Costas, you know. And mm-hmm. but really, what the documentary led to was like, well, we still have another game to play against Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> And we're fucked. And dude, it, it was just so amazing for Bert to congratulate Jordan. He was like, fuck you, you bitch. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that shit was hilarious. Yeah, and, and, and I feel that, you know, like, Bert took it because, you know, hey, that's the ball busting that we do. Yeah. You know, so... <laughs> That yeah, was no, awesome. he was like, you, he just came up, you bitch. That <laughs> felt like, uh, yeah, let me pull it up. Yeah, he goes, fuck you. And he goes, you gave us a run for our money. And then Jordan goes, you can work on that golf game of yours. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the line right there. <laughs> yeah, you, by, by societal observation, guys, don't you think the the old school heads the 80s and 90s guys more specifically the 80s guys right mm-hmm. they were harsher amongst each others but they meant what that harsh meant that big or that harshness meant mm-hmm. right like it was understood like oh we're all fighting a war so this is just how we talk in the war in in the bunker mm-hmm. Well, remember, kids these days, you know, all the NBA players, they grew up playing with each other. <laughs> you know, there's this big group of friends out there. You know, back then, it's like, you know, a guy from French Lake, Indiana, you know, might have not seen a guy from, you know, Lansing, Michigan until they met in the um, NCAA finals, you know. Um, and the next time they see each other, they're basically part of rival teams. The animosity builds up between them two because they were never friends to begin with. A lot of these guys who play now, you know, I mean, a lot of, with a lot of the mentoring going on, you know, there, there's a lot of personal relationships in the NBA. There, there just is. It just that's just how it is, you know. I mean, but back then there just wasn't. You know, you couldn't pick up your cell phone and call somebody. You had to call their house, hoping they're home. Mm-hmm. You know, so. You know how you mentioned Joel the the Reggie Miller's so awesome at shoving. Mm-hmm. Granted, um, it was Ahmad Rashad and Bob Costas who are like compatriots of Jordan who said it. Yeah, but do you two buy what they said that Byron Russell was already moving that way, so it was really not that intense a push. Um, for jo- Jordan's, you know, Chicago Bulls peak Jordan's shove on Byron Russell on winning game six. Because I'm such a Jordanite, I always thought that. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't as hard a shove. Because if you look at Byron Russell, he was already you know, trying to catch up at that, at that point. Mm-hmm. Still a shove, though. Yeah, he, he mentioned earlier, I, I forgot what episode, but he mentioned that... Um... Number one, Byron Russell played defense on his toes, so he would lean a lot. So that tells me that Jordan was really good at studying his opponent, especially a guy like Byron Russell, who he had beef against since his what since his uh, rookie year. Remember he, he talked about that, so he knew everything he knew about Byron Bar- Russell. And the other thing that comes into play is the way Jordan. It, it feels like when he plays the 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 clutch moments the whole game slows down then. He kind of thrives on chaos. That's just kind of how, how he is. So when the clutch moments come, it slows down him. So when he saw Byron Russell, I'm pretty sure he knew he was already going in that direction. I'm not surprised if that little nudge made him go more in that direction, I would say. Because just because Jordan's good at seeing those little things and letting the game slow down for him in those moments. So you agree mm-hmm. with Ahmad Rashad, Bob Costas, and myself? Yes, that okay. he was going that direction, but you know Jordan helped him a lot <laughs> to go to go in that direction. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel I, yeah, yeah, no, I feel the same way. 
I mean, he was already, yeah, he was going yeah. in that direction already. But yeah, Jordan kind of helped him a little bit go further than that. I mean, like, I mean, like in in football, I mean, you could have a receiver running down the sideline, you know, and make a turn. You can barely tap him. He's gonna go off route. You don't have to give that much force if he's already going one way. It doesn't take that much to push that guy up, up the way. Same thing with with uh, Jordan and Byron Russell. I mean, he was already going that way. All his momentum was going that way. So, it was a little push, though. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, three-way, we all agree. Yeah. Yeah, because for me, it, it was kind of amazing how, like, Stockton would throw a mid-dribble full-court pass. But- oh, uh- Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, his strength like that, but Byron Russell would not have the ability to control his body. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's used to digging up Jordan and talking shit to Jordan. So I, I didn't, I didn't completely buy that it was a full shove. And I'm not even trying yeah. to be a, um, a recency bias kind of guy just because I just <laughs> saw the doc. You know. There's an offensive hand check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. That that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. But even he, he, uh, the one thing I did want to avoid, speaking of recency bias, is there was that um, screenshot that I uh, that I sent you guys, where mm-hmm. it was so unfair. It was Jordan versus LeBron, and I think everyone yeah. and their mother will agree the better passer is LeBron. Yes. Yes. Did you guys know any detail about that? I didn't have time to look into if that was Nick Wright okay. or where it came from. It was an ESPN thing based out of ESPN, hmm. right? If it, from I'm looking at it, and I'm pretty sure because of the percentages, this probably was a poll. <laughs> right. So I'm guess, and then with the airing of the documentary, I don't know how the numbers would not be swayed in Jordan's favor right now. You know, and yeah, you're right. That better passer, I mean, hands down. I mean, LeBron is the better passer. And I would, and I would say even, he might even be a preferred teammate if you pull the players as opposed to, um, you know, fans, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because the fans fans are going to look at what Jordan, I mean, his his resume and be like, yeah, I want to play the winner. But, you know, if you want some, if you want your teammate to buy you some Balenciaga, you know, some shoes, and to hang out with you and go to a club with you, I mean, you know, have more fun in the NBA. LeBron might be your guy. You know, his, mm-hmm. his players in the NBA they follow him around to his different teams. You know, it kind of shows. So, but other than that, everything else looks pretty spot on to me. I've to admit. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, and and the one thing that that I did like about the um, on episode nine, if I remember correctly, is uh, the story of Gus, the security guy. Yes. You know, I, I, yeah. Kobe, yeah. Kobe has done so much stuff behind the scenes, Shaq, and that's just Lakers based, you know, uh, Pau Gasol. But to see that, that, you know, we were talking about it in the past that Jordan became friends with his security people. You know that guy with the weird yeah. hair and did the Jordan shrug, winning that fucking <laughs> <laughs> stupid ass quarters game. Like, dude, that's those guys were like his best friends. Yeah, those were his, his lifelong boys. I mean, yeah, the guy with the weird haircut. He was like watching over his property or something too after like after the NBA stuff, right? Yeah, yeah kind of like that, kind of like that bald dude who always follows Shaq around, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, it, and it's it's amazing that um, it's so corny the way he looked, but you know they were saying that he was a cop and he was a badass street patrol guy, mm-hmm. you know. But it's just you know he had big glasses and kind of acted more like an uncle than a tough security person. Yeah, but you know if if if. Uh, if that's what they said, you're going to have to trust it. But, you know, th- that game seven ball that he gave to him, I- I'm sure that dude 
it like he even said it, you know, he's all that's just something else, but mm-hmm. I, I would have fucking cried like a bitch, dude. If if someone gave me a game ball seven that causal to Jordan winning, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That that was a that was a really good moment to see that even someone as a hard ass like Jordan fucking you know could do something like that. Did did you guys uh, know about Steve Kerr and his father? I actually no, I did. Didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember reading about that, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. A big story. Um, but I do remember reading about that in the LA Times somewhere a long time ago. Um, so when he, when they brought it up, I, I pretty much wasn't surprised, you know, but mm-hmm. how they brought it up was pretty cool, you know. You know, they, they asked him, you know, did, did you ever talk about your dad at Jordan? You know, he said no. Yeah. So. Deans? Yeah, no, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know about Steve Kerr's dad, but just just hearing the story of that and then how, you know, how that affected Kerr and how he immersed himself in basketball to get away from that almost, to help him, you know, to help him overcome that, it was just, it was, it was, it was good to hear. Yeah, and there's, there's so many different things that, uh, backstory wise that everyone has and what, what, what was the most weird and proven statement that Steve Kerr made that Jordan is like a God, like a deity is for them not to communicate about that because you're like on eggshells around the God. Right. You know, you're you're walking on eggshells because it's like, oh, it's Jordan. And you would think, hey, your dad passed. My dad was was well past is is very soft. Both fathers were killed. Uh You know, and and you would think. It's kind of like an AA meeting, you know, hey, you have issues with alcohol. I have issues with alcohol. Let's talk. And, And that's the kind of God like. Treatment where someone like Judd Buchler would be like, dude, we were scared of Jordan. <laughs> well, where you could really connect at that point, and they, 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 they didn't. I thought that would have been, well, it wouldn't matter on the court, right? But definitely, I think that the relationship with Jordan and Kerr was like such a distant one. It's like, hey, you're a backup point guard. You, you should shoot. That's it. Mm-hmm. So for for me, I thought yeah. that was um, really good. I really love Steve Kerr's uh, sense of humor. Like in the past episode, where you know they replayed him during the championship parade, yeah. it's like, oh, here I go again. I'm gonna bail out Michael Jordan. <laughs> you know, so much props to Steve Kerr. Yeah. Do you guys view him a little bit uh, with more respect now? How do you guys view Steve Kerr? Oh, uh, no, not really. It's all the same. I mean, I mean, I know more about him, but I've never like disliked him or anything like that. So it's just good to mm-hmm. hear his story, his background, because that, that I didn't know about him. Um, yeah, same here. Um, I'm indifferent. Uh, but, you know, I will say Mark Jackson could have won a championship that year, but <laughs> that's another conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know it's funny you you think about that Pacers team where it's like Mark Jackson, Reggie Miller, uh, Chris Mullen, uh, they had Jalen Rose coming off the bench, the Davis brothers, and Rick Smiths. But it's still at that point it was just it was only Mark Jackson that was creating the offense, and then the moment they put fucking Pippen on him, it's like ah here you oh. go, here you go, mm-hmm. here you go. Oh man, ladies first. It's the Lakers all over again, huh? Yeah, exactly. It was like, uh, <laughs> and, and worse because fucking Mark Jackson was back, like him and Travis Best. Well, yeah. I think Travis Best was a little bit more fucking dribbly. He like pounded yeah. that fucking hardwood the way he would dribble. 
But Mark Jackson, the way he he would back his fat ass to against like the point guards, and he would move him like like Bonzi Wells, and then when Pippen was put on him, it's like, oh, okay, damn this, it, <laughs> nothing's gonna happen now. Yeah. Uh, another thing that that I noticed that was really awesome, and and I want to get your input, guys. That there's several incidents, but the one particular one they showed at the dock was when Rodman and Malone tried to get up three times, but they kept intentionally tripping each other. But yeah. it, but in the end, they slapped each other on the butt and were like, "All right, all right, all right," you know. Yeah. That that wouldn't fly <laughs> nowadays, right? For several reasons. No, hell no, hell no. <laughs> that would not fly. That was basically two assholes acknowledging each other's assholery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I saw that. And it was awesome. It was a great moment. And it's like, you want to see, that's the kind of stuff you want to see. You know, like, they're, they're, they're almost homies. And you, when you play against your homie, you go hard. And you mm-hmm. make you try to make them look silly. And I think, that I don't know if they're homies or not, but they, they certainly did respect each other on the court. And it kind of showed in that little sequence. And yeah, it was you know, pretty funny to me. One of those things, like you know, you hear people that have been watching the NBA, you know, since the eighties and nineties, are always talking about like how soft the NBA is now. How you see more physical back in the day. That right there, what they were doing right there, you know, that was old school basketball. They fuck each other up, get up, hey, good shit. All right, move on, let's play. But now you see two players doing that. Oh fuck, there's all kinds of fouls being called, all kinds of teas. People gonna get broken up. People sent mm-hmm. to the locker room. Great. And people, people like screaming for a foul, you know, like looking at the ref yeah. before they're looking at their opponent. <laughs> so. mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I think the last of the spirit I've seen that was dirty fuck face Derek Fisher when he elbowed um, Luis Scola. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? That was, that was the was last gangster, of that. <laughs> huh? Yeah. That was it. Scola was a tough player too, you know. And Derek Fisher was a bulldog. So, yeah, that's a, that, that was a good moment. <laughs> and then fucking Ron Artest decides to decapitate fucking uh, the beard when he elbows him oh. in celebration. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that that, wow. that 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 to me that's the one thing I do miss, but I don't think it would fly because um you know like. Living a life of 44 years, what you're used to, the inverse will happen. Yeah. You know, it, it, mm-hmm. it, it, it's like before when cell phones were made, it's like, why are you trying to put in a camera? Why are you trying to put in a, a recorder? That's what a, a voice recorder is for. And that's what a mm-hmm. camera is for. You carry that with you. But, you know, everything you think will... Go opposite, you know, and in development. Uh, before we wrap, do you guys still feel there were converts of uh, Kobe fans and LeBron fans that won uh, the opinion that Jordan might be the GOAT? Yeah, there was for about a week. You mean not not anymore? <laughs> no, for about a week they're they're gonna be like Jordan's the greatest, Jordan's the greatest, mm-hmm. and then you know I mean, and then time's gonna pass, right? And then they're gonna they're gonna start so, thinking so, about. So like when the are you saying like when the hype dies down of the last dance show, mm-hmm. they, they just go back? Yeah, okay. Yeah, if if the NBA starts up again, you know they're gonna we're gonna see more of LeBron, we're gonna see more of the Greek Freak, and then they're gonna be like, man, these guys are really good. You know, you know, and of course they're going to forget what, you know, they're going to forget the past. They, you know, they're kind of a living in now society, right? Um, these, uh, younger ones. So. You deans. Yeah. Yeah. I think right now, well, like what I said in the beginning, I didn't think that, you know, that they put, I guess, Jordan as the goat because of, well, this is more for the younger Cats watching this, so yeah, I don't, I didn't think that they put him as like the top goat, goat, but 
they would definitely, you know, give them more props. And like Joel said, like, I mean, for about a week, they're going to be all up on this. Like, hey, God, it's fucking sick, but can it really move up to number one in anybody's list? I don't think. Yeah, for me, um, what's changed? I- I've seen a little bit of the fans change where their tones mm-hmm. like uh, from Kobeites, from Kobe fans. I've I've seen the change from Kobe fans. The LeBron fans, that's a little bit harder to turn uh, head-wise. Mm-hmm. You know, but I've seen a significant amount of Kobe fans go, oh, okay, Jordan is ahead, which I didn't expect. But from mm-hmm. young younger podcasters, they've definitely turned their heads, to be fair, um, from my observation. Mm-hmm. But, gr- but great job, guys. Uh, that's it for The Last Dance Doc and... It's been good, guys. It's been good. Now back to Lakers and Evergreen topics and theory about when the NBA will start. But uh, signing off, it's the Lakers mixtape. Thanks.